Welcome everybody to this seminar on countering targeted attacks, otherwise known as APT defense. I'm Richard Steenen. I'm a industry analyst. I uh, teach a university course uh, remotely in Australia on uh, cyber warfare. And I've written a couple of books on cyber warfare. As a industry analyst, I have to keep on top of uh, what is cutting edge in the uh, defense space. So I track the products and the companies and the defenders. So I'm gonna give you my perspectives on countering targeted attacks, starting with diving into why this is so different than everything else. I used to start every presentation uh, when I was at Gartner, when I talked about the attacks and the threats uh, with this hierarchy and targeted attacks is way at the top, but it was something, you know, 15 years ago that we didn't see very much of, but obviously that's changed dramatically over the years. Um, and the difference in the, it's a difference in mindset when you're a defender to understand that the adversary knows who you are. They're going to discover what information you have. They know you've got it and they will stop at nothing. And this is so much different than the worms and viruses and maybe the hacktivists who uh, attack you just because you're vulnerable. So if, if you put up a website and you've got a SQL vul uh, uh, vulnerability in it, somebody's going to test that and figure out that they can grab all your data from all your users. But a targeted adversary is, yes, going to discover all those vulnerabilities but they're gonna to attempt to exploit them in such a way that they get to their target, which is your particular data. And it could be your intellectual property, could be the backend systems to your financial services so they can uh, exchange or steal a bunch of money directly from you. Um, or it could be a couple of nation states battling each other and they wanna just do damage. And uh, we'll see examples of that. So. Let's look at one of those examples. Saudi Aramco, <clears throat> biggest oil, uh, oil and gas exploration and refining operation in the world. I think if it went public, it would be worth something like $2 trillion, so even bigger than Apple and Microsoft, which are currently the biggest uh, publicly traded companies. They were targeted over a period of time in such a way that the attackers strongly attributed to Iran, were able to infect 30,000 PCs with the Shamoon malware. Now, we don't know, even to this day, if they were stealing information from Saudi Aramco, but the, we, we learned about uh, the damage that was being done when they started to systematically destroy the boot sectors and as much data as possible on every single hard drive on all of those 30,000 PCs. Completely devastating. Very, very luckily, uh, Shamoon didn't cross over, you know, hopefully the air gaps to the operational side of their refineries. So their refineries could still operate. But the entire front office of a very large organization was completely put out of business for the time it took them to recover. The recovery itself uh, kind of made history. They deployed a team to China in order to buy up all of the hard drives that they could get their hands on uh, to replace those the hard drives on those 30,000 PCs. They just didn't, they wanted to be sure that there was no persistence left so they didn't want to rebuild um, and scrub those hard drives. Uh, they started with fresh, clean hard drives. <clears throat> and we could talk later, uh, maybe in the Q&A, about uh, third-party and supply chain risk, because obviously that's a great avenue to uh, targeting organizations as well, is go ahead and infect the hard drives at the manufacturing site. At any rate, Saudi Rampo still remains uh, one of the most devastating attacks in our cyber history. <clears throat> of course, we can't talk about targeted attacks without talking about the most sophisticated targeted attack ever uh, reported on, and that's Stuxnet, sometimes known as, as Operation Olympic Game. 
Um, Stuxnet was a targeted operation, the Olympic game was, uh, attributed to a division of the National Security Agency in the United States, supposedly with some help from uh, Israeli, uh, you know, either government or technology sources. Um, it was remarkable in that it used four zero days um, that would, for instance, uh, CVE 2010-2568 um, was a vulnerability that we hadn't known about in a Windows shortcut such that if you put a thumb drive into a PC, uh, it would automatically execute the uh, malware that was on the thumb drive. And that malware, of course, was Stuxnet. Um, other vulnerabilities used uh, uh, remote code execu execution capabilities. There were two escalation of privilege vulnerabilities. Um, and, you know, zero day vulnerabilities are expensive to hold on to. They're expensive to discover. Um, they're, they're expensive to stockpile. And, of course, for a nation state, in this case the United States, um, they run the risk of leaving, you know, their own uh, citizens and companies exposed to these vulnerabilities once they've discovered them and they haven't disclosed them to the rest of the world. Uh, so there, there's this window of opportunity to use a zero-day vulnerability that uh, diminishes with time because somebody else could discover the same vulnerability. Stuxnet had four of them, at least four. Stuxnet was kind of, you know, when you dig into it, it was actually pretty straightforward. So to understand uh, OT, operations technology, industrial control systems, you got to understand that on a plant floor of any type, a manufacturer with robots and conveyors and um, uh, chemical processes with sensors that are being controlled uh, by programs, um, all tied back into a PLC, a programmable logic controller, which just a kind of kind of computer. This happens to be a picture of the PLC that was uh, uh, targeted directly by Stuxnet. Um, not the very one, but the same model. Um, I grabbed this picture mm -hmm. at a cyber range in Israel where they had put it on display. Uh, basically, once Stuxnet got a foothold inside the facility that it was targeting, in this case, it was uh, a, a, a nuclear uranium refining capability uh, inside Iran. Um, it would look for, it would spread like a worm from machine to machine and look for installations of a software program called Step 7. That software is a management council for uh, creating the code and uh, instruction sets <clears throat> for these PLCs. It would replace the standard uh, DLL uh, for step seven <clears throat> with a specific rootkit uh, that would only kick off if it saw a particular command set going through. In other words, like the command set for a particular centrifuge controller uh, that the attackers knew would be running in these uranium refining facilities. If it didn't see that command set, nothing would happen. It would just let the original DLL operate. If it did see that command set, it would replace it. And it would change the rate of rotation for a centrifuge. This is what those centrifuges look like. They spin, they're, they're gas centrifuges. So they're spinning gas at, and the machines doing the spinning are operating at about 60,000 RPM. And all you have to do is figure out you know, what the uh, natural frequency is of that stack, and then you could excite it by rotating the, the uh, motor at that speed, or you could vary the speed or make the speed go way over what the, what the motor can handle. At any rate, over a thousand centrifuges in the TANS, these are all cascading things, the gas, the radioactive gas flows from one to the next. Over 1,000 over a period of months were destroyed, and, uh, the engineers in Iran evidently didn't realize that this was an attack. You know, they thought there's some bug in the system or some fault in the way they designed it. Uh, so they were operating as if they didn't have 
an attacker. Uh, but after um, you know several reports in the New York Times, they figure that out, and maybe the attack on Saudi Aramco was a response to that. We don't know. <clears throat> Let's jump ahead a little bit uh, because we still see a lot of so-called APTs going on. I think NotPetya, which uh, was released and did all of its jam damage in June of 2017, is a great example of a very carefully orchestrated targeted attack. So in Ukraine, there is a uh, specialized accounting package. Think of it as a uh, QuickBooks for mostly Ukraine called MEDOC. Over months, the MEDOC uh, software update servers, you know, in their locations uh, or in their data center were uh, targeted and taken over in such a way that the attackers could send out a software update to all the customers of MEDOC that would uh, infect their systems with a worm that would then, once it got that seeded uh, foothold, spread throughout the, the rest of the organization. Uh, it was using an exploit that we already knew about because uh, a group called Shadow Brokers had, uh, had released it. So they had released the knowledge of the zero day and the exploit against it um, called Eternal Blue. This, this is uh, attributed to the NSA. It was part of their hacking toolkit. Um, and then it also combined the credential theft capabilities of Minicats, which is an open source way to see clear text uh, credentials in Windows machine. So what's fascinating here is that the global shipper Mirsk, you know, so giant company, uh, ships a huge percent of uh, materials of the entire global market around the world. Uh, a single accountant in Odessa, uh, in Ukraine, needed MEDOC for his operations. So the IT staff had facilitated that, and now he had the accounting package that he was used to and needed. Um, he got infected in the first day. It spread throughout all of Mirsk in a matter of hours. It shut them down for nine days. They had to spend massive amounts of money. They hired hundreds of people from uh, Deloitte to man a operation center in the UK in order to go out and re basically, you know, re-image all of their machines. Uh, they claim, and they've had to report a loss of $300 million in lost revenue and recovery costs. Comes close to, uh, you know, my uh, measure for real losses. So it's not the we lost intellectual property and that turns into millions of dollars. It's we had to report a loss on our quarterly results of $300 million. They had to re-image 4,000 servers and 45,000 PCs. So in essence, you know, this is a, a higher impact attack than uh, than even Saudi Aramco. Other organizations like TNT, which is a mainly European-based uh, shipping company, claims they lost $400 million. And Merck, the big pharmaceutical company, reported an $870 million loss from a similar similar uh, experiences with not pet yet. So, yeah, you know, the, the reason this is targeted was it was meant to do damage. It was meant to do damage in Ukraine. And, you know, the, the spotlight of attribution, of course, shines on Russia or Russian hackers for doing that. And then if you've been following the news recently, um, you've read about Shadowhammer. So this uh, occurred just uh, this past uh, June, and uh, June through November. So it was an ongoing attack, very similar to NotPetya. The attackers targeted the update servers at the PC manufacturer Asus. Um, so they got access to the Asus live update service and installed a malicious update. So this is very, first of all, interesting that this was uh, reported on and discovered by Kaspersky Lab. 
Kaspersky Lab looks for these kinds of things. They are the ones who uh, first reported on the Flame uh, malware that actually use Microsoft update services, but they didn't infect Microsoft's systems. Um, they just targeted a particular companies and then they had created a MD5 hash collision, which is really, really hard to do. Uh, it could cost uh, over a quarter million dollars in a lot of uh, machines in order to do that. Um, and they created a, uh, basically they could sign a update and send it to their target and the target would think that it was a legitimately signed by Microsoft uh, update and they would run it and get infected. So um, Shadowhammer, you know, took the more direct route and actually got on the servers at Asus to send out this update. The update uh, looked highly targeted. Uh, the executable, once it was downloaded on a machine, would check the MAC address on the machine against a list of targets uh, to determine if uh, it should take the next steps, which we'll get into in a second here. Uh, if it wasn't on the target list, then there'd be no persistence and the, the victims, uh, you know, basically be free to move on, not worry about it. So what is an APT? When the, when the terms first started being used, and Richard Baitlick uh, over at Dow Security Blog gets a lot of credit for popularizing it, um, it was actually a internal uh, terminology used by uh, the US Air Force in particular, but quickly spread to most government, advanced persistent threat. Um, so it sounds nasty, um, but what it really turned into was code name for a nation state hacking team and their activities. The URL there is to an air table that a researcher has put together of all of the APT teams that have been identified to date. There are over 200 of them. Um, and I'll show you a screenshot of that later on in the presentation. So let's look at the anatomy of an attack from the perspective of an APT. So the very first step in any targeted attack is reconnaissance, right? How do they know what you have and how do they know who has it in the organization? Uh, so an attacker is going to research your organization or if they're attacking you in particular, they're gonna research you, uh, the equivalent of doxing you. They're not gonna publish it. Uh, they're gonna use that information in order to uh, execute their attack. So they'll look at the company's websites, they'll read its financials, they'll read its patent applications. Um, they'll look through LinkedIn at all the employees of the company, identify the actual people there. Um, they'll attempt to find the, those people's uh, social networks that they're on, be it Facebook or Twitter. Uh, they might even uh, look at conference presentations made by the CISO, where they might reveal the types of defensive systems that they have in place. So the reconnaissance phase is the most difficult to detect. Uh, it's kind of hard to know when somebody's reconning your organization because that's what all of your social media is about, is let people look at what you've got. And then there's the weaponization phase. So now they craft an attack that is going to uh, attack those individuals in the organization, or if it's a you know, direct attack against vulnerable servers, they'll figure that out, but it's called wep uh, weaponization. So it might be uh, crafting a phishing email that they're gonna send to particular targets uh, and make it as believable as possible and encourage somebody to open up an attachment or click on a link, and then uh, they go ahead and deliver that. And, see where they get with it. So the next phase, you know, as soon as somebody clicks on a link, opens something, uh, then the uh, exploitation starts to occur. So like Stuxnet uh, or NotPetya, a zero day vulnerability and an exploit against it is used. They'll get uh, privilege escalation to try and get system administrator rights. Uh, so they can install more software and then they'll engage in lateral movement towards the target. Quite often that involves an attack on the Active, active Directory server where all the credentials are stored. And if they can get there, then they can get 
practically anywhere in the organization. And finally, they either are exfiltrating data uh, or destroying things like at Saudi Aramco or, or um, you know, any of the attacks against South Korea um, that were very uh, Saudi Aramco-like in that they were just destroying, just causing disruption. So let's look at one of the more sophisticated such targeted attacks. This is attributed to China, uh, and it attacked uh, uh, the RSA, the security division of EMC at the time, now part of Dell. And when you talk to the team, which was quite large at RSA, there were about 22 people in their uh, security operations center. When you talk to them, they, they talk about these two phases. Phase one sounded like the early uh, just poking around and trying to you know see what was there and how they could get to stuff. So it's kind of exploratory, but they're already in the network. They got in the network by weaponizing a spreadsheet that was being shared amongst internal RSA people and an outside firm. And the spreadsheet was of, of their uh, benefits packages. So the team was working on it and they'd share the spreadsheet around. Um, they managed to get on the email server uh, or spoof the email of one of the people at the outside firm and, and send the weaponized spreadsheet to, I think the number was 11 people inside the organization. Three or four actually did open it. Uh, we found later on researchers were able to find the exploit because it ended up in uh, the virus total database. Just nobody thought to look at it. Um, but that exploit opened the doors. And during that phase one, the attackers were kind of working nine to five Beijing time, uh, you know, trying to get to what they're trying to get to. RSA didn't really know what they're trying to get to, you know, where they're just going to do damage, where they're going to steal our customer database, etc. But then the CISO told me how it felt like they had brought in the A team all of a sudden. As soon as they could see that that were, that RSA was onto the attackers, bring in the A team and everything accelerated. And by this time RSA was on high alert and a single researcher had been called in from vacation and he's in their security operations center and he saw a large file being exfiltrated and he hit the big red button that shut off RSA from the internet and stopped the transfer. That transfer was of the file, I suspect it was a spreadsheet, of the, the uh, secret seeds to RSA secure ID tokens. So one-time password tokens, uh, the way RSA has implemented them have a secret seed in them. And researchers have been looking at these for 20 years, trying to see how they could get the device itself to give up its secret seed. So there's a body of literature on how to how to do this. Um, usually it involved destroying the token and you know which doesn't help you if you're trying to generate a new one-time password to get into a target. So now the secret seeds were stolen. Somebody could actually, you know, a really sophisticated attacker could figure out which secret seed was assigned to which token and then attempt to uh, to get into a highly secure online service. Well, RSA didn't recognize that all that could have happened. Um, and they published uh, this notice to the world that they are confident that the information extracted extracted does not enable a successful direct attack on any of our RSA secure ID customers. Because only a couple months after that, at Lockheed Martin, somebody attempted to log in remotely and with a authenticated RSA secure ID token. And Lockheed Martin recognized that this must be spoofed and they shut off all access to Lockheed Martin networks from external sites. They, the first we heard of it in the public was Lockheed Martin sent a letter uh, communication to every employee and they put signs on the doors that you had to come into the office if you wanted to get on the Lockheed Martin network. And as, as we dug into it, we realized that Lockheed Martin had been using a 
very specialized defense system against targeted attacks. They track campaigns and they, basically they identify the similar uh, methods and tools being used by uh, a group. You know, it could be same time of day, same IP address range, even though they're coming, you know, through various proxies. Um, could be the same kind of malware stuck into the executables that they send in, in emails, etc. They lump all those similar uh, attack methods into a campaign. They have been tracking this particular campaign for over a year. They recognize when uh, you know, an, a, either an IP address or the time of day or something about the remote access with an RSA secure ID token uh, clued them in that this was a campaign actor that was trying to get in. And to me, that just changed my entire perspective on what uh, targeted attack defense could be. It made me realize, uh, and this is all the way back in 2010, that the entire industry is going to have to catch up. There will be tools to help people do this kind of campaign tracking. Um, there will be managed security service providers that will get to the same level of capability as Lockheed. Um, and every large organization, you know, on the size of Lockheed, 80,000 employees and dealing with, you know, top secret material because they're a, a weapon systems developer, uh, every large organization will have to build this capability. And Lockheed has published a really good template of how to do that. So I highly uh, recommended that you look up the Lockheed Martin Cyber Kill Chain white paper of 2011. They lay out the phases of an attack and the course of action matrix for blocking that attack. So going down from the top, uh, similar to what uh, my APT um, anatomy of an attack looks like, there's reconnaissance, weaponization, the delivery, the exploitation, uh, installation of the actual code that they need to execute, the command and control, so they're communicating and you know, they have uh, eyes on glass inside your network, and then the actions on objectives. And Lockheed you know, lines up a few uh, uh, tools and capabilities against each of those phases. Interesting that they think that web analytics can detect reconnaissance, and that may be true, right? If you see a lot of activity, uh, you know, deep into your data or something on your website, uh, all coming from the same IP address, and maybe if it's associated with a, a campaign, then you can say, wow, somebody's doing reconnaissance on us. So we've got all these steps. We don't have um, a lot of tools down in the degrade and disrupt side other than backup and recovery systems. The deceive side are one of the areas that uh, people are building a lot of tools on. It's the deception network. Um, kind of hard to to protect against the destruction phase um, other than taking systems offline. So maybe there should be a big red button there. So, you know, we've talked about Russian attacks. We've talked about Chinese attacks. What about the NSA inside the US government? So the uh, what we know most about the NSA was published in Der Spiegel online. Um, and it basically introduced us to the uh, tailored Access Operations Group, um, and the title was The Unit Offers Spy Gadgets for Every Need. You start paging through this 20-plus page catalog that the Der Spiegel got from a uh, leaker inside the NSA, we believe, and we also believe that it was not Edward Snowden. Edward Snowden didn't reveal any tools and toolkits but this particular leaker did, the person is still not uh, known. And this is what the pages of the Tao uh, Ant catalog look like. Uh, it's basically, you know, PDF document, um, a description of the capability, and obviously meant for, uh, you know, intelligence operations groups who had targeted a particular uh, country, organization person, 
um, and they needed a particular capability. So if you were uh, targeting somebody and you realized that they had uh, Dell PowerEdge servers, um, then you would go to Deity Bounce and you would figure out how to install Deity Bounce uh, with you know, the weaponization and delivery and all the rest of it on that server. Uh, and that would give you remote access to the server and it gives you persistence. So it survives even after uh, a system's been totally re-imaged, uh, it's still there. There were other um, tools that are worth looking at in the DAO catalog. Um, the ones I love are the microwave reflectors for spying on systems. So they would have to interdict the hardware uh, as it was being delivered or, or with a black bag operation, get into a piece of hardware inside a, an operation and install these little things on the motherboards that uh, were completely passive. But if you illuminated them remotely with radar, they would reflect back uh, what was going on on the motherboard. In other words, you could tap right into the data flows on a, on a computer's motherboard. Um, totally passively, you'd have to have a radar detector in order to figure out that that was going on. So a lot of cool stuff. So I promised you we'd look at that uh, Airtable uh, uh, spreadsheet. Uh, a researcher has nicely provided us with uh, just a summation of all of the public research that's out there. Uh, right now, there are 214 named groups. Uh, there are 77 Chinese hacking teams, 20 associated with Iran, 16 with Russia, North Korea, nine. Um, and missing from all of this are USA hacking teams. So that, you know, you have to think that the USA has a lot of separate teams similar to uh, what Olympic Games was for Stuxnet. Um, but I, I suspect the researcher who put this together is you know, a U.S. citizen and also a former, uh, you know, former NSA employee. So obviously they would be restricted from talking about USA teams still. You know, uh, defenders should be familiar with these hacking teams and their tools, techniques, procedures, and all the indicators of compromise associated with them. Because uh, I believe it's really important to know when you're under attack by a sophisticated uh, uh, APT. And if you want to go back to the history of APTs, it was at uh, Mandiant in February of 2013 that they published the the very first APT report, APT-1, still of historical significance. They identified the unit of the People's Liberation Army in China responsible for these attacks. They had an appendix with 3,000 indicators of compromise. So domain names used, IP addresses, uh, encryption certificates, and MD5 hashes of malware. So you could use that. and you know, the impact of this report was dramatic. Everybody with a intrusion detection system or a network monitor uh, started to fold in these 3,000 indicators of compromise. So you could tell right away if you were uh, under attack from these people. This changed the industry as well. Before, you know, the primary, uh, you know, security defense was policy and signature-based controls. So antivirus and for signature-based and policy as enforced by firewalls and intrusion prevention systems. After the APT-1 report, the industry kind of woke up, so this is the next big thing, and we see the rise of all the breach response uh, vendors that are out there that are helping you do the things that I talked about Lockheed Martin being able to do. Have to give another nod to Richard Baitlick on incident or breach response. Um, and he's kind of got his three rules of, of how do you measure how good you are. You have to detect the compromise as efficiently as possible, you know, so as with as few resources as possible. You have to respond to incidents as quickly as possible. We'll talk about uh, time to respond in a second. And investigate using digital forensics as effectively as possible. If you've got a lot of data, it can be cumbersome if you're doing it manually. So you need tools in order to help you. That's where you know 
uh, graph databases come in, uh, uh, threat hunting, they call it, uh, but it's a way of making connections between disparate data points to figure out what happened or what is happening uh, during a breach. So I've attempted to create a list of the actual tools required for uh, a breach response. Uh, network monitoring, very, very important, capture as much of network traffic as possible. The CISO of, of uh, uh, RSA said the one thing that he wished he had more of was recorded network traffic to figure out uh, what was going on during the attack against them. Endpoint monitoring is becoming a, a critical component of this, so actually watching what's happening um, on all the PCs, cell phones, servers, um, to see if they are uh, you know, going out of range of what they're normally doing. So kind of behavior analysis, as well as you know weird anomalies like different system calls that indicate a compromise has occurred. User and entity monitoring, so basically monitoring either devices or people to see if they're logging in from a different geolocation than they should be at, uh, different time of day, different frequency. Uh, you can discern a lot of information from user and entity uh, behavior monitoring. Threat intelligence is, thing, is the information that you consume generated by other research organizations, typically threat intelligence feeds. Uh, and you ingest them, so you're getting all these indicators of compromise, IP addresses, domains, et cetera, and then comparing them to all that data that you've collected on your own network to make sure that uh, uh, you're not under attack. Or if you are attacked, letting you know as soon as possible uh, you're under attack from those organizations. Deception is a cool new area. Basically, it's, you know, you deploy hundreds if not thousands of uh, fake machines that the rest of the corporate network doesn't know about. But if you actually start seeing activity on them, you probably are uh, under attack. And luckily, the attacker's not on the right machine. The good stuff's not there. Orchestration comes into play because when we're talking about uh, time to respond, you don't want to have to you know, go through a complicated process in order to change a firewall rule you know, that needs three signatures if you're under attack today. And all you got to do is block that IP address to slow down the attacker uh, and, you know, reset a, a user ID, force them to update their password and, and uh, use their uh, cell phone to do so. Uh, orchestration is the way that we're starting to build capability to automate responses. And finally, isolation and cleanup discover the machines where the foothold was gained, where the persistence still is, and clean them up, all the way to the Saudi Aramco methodology of replace the machines or uh, you know, do a really good job of wiping those disks and rebuilding them. Bela calls it contain, eradicate, and recover. So just real quick, network monitoring includes NetFlow, uh, and other flows, and all the way up to full packet capture, complete network forensics, and the ability to reconstruct an attack. So the good network monitoring solutions will let you replay, uh, you know, what's happening on your network. Endpoint monitoring, I'm not going to name all the, the the unicorns that are in this place, but they tend to, you know, it's client software, looks for malicious activity or unusual activity, uh, quite often can block that activity or at least alert you of what's going on so you know when you have an effective machine. We talked about user and entity monitoring, uh, uh, UBA or EUBA, uh, and there's another area that's getting a lot of attention lately. Threat intelligence, there are 60 open source feeds you can subscribe to uh, for free, um, and then there's couple dozen of specialty threat intelligence companies that uh, will you know, mine the dark web or even assign them, you know, tell us all the attacks or discussion going on about attacking our CEO and or his family or her family. Deception I talked about is uh, this cool, you know, honeypots distributed. There's some deception vendors uh, that will actually help you create false LinkedIn profiles for employees that look real, you know, got everything you need there, um, with the idea being that if you're under reconnaissance, 
you might see people trying to log in as those employees, which immediately tells you that an attacker is using LinkedIn profiles to figure out how to get into your systems. Security orchestration, it's, it's funny, the, the companies that get into it seem to get acquired really quickly. Um, but it's a, very simply put today, it's, you know, how can we update firewall rule sets uh, without involving the procedures we had in place before a dangerous thing, right? You don't want to change firewall rule sets because it breaks things. But sometimes uh, the risk is too high not to do it, so you do it. Uh, password resets, uh, uh, network segmentation, you know, break the system out into, you know, send out new uh, ARP, uh, ARP updates in order to change the network configuration. I think that security orchestration is uh, critical to defending against targeted attacks because right now the targeted attacks all, all have seemed to be people on the other end of the world in front of their screens managing their attack against you, that's going to change. One call out to a new field called security instrumentation. Uh, so instead of pen testing, you know, scanning and trying to break into a system with an outside service or group, um, you actually instrument all of your firewalls and your intrusion prevention systems and your security uh, event and information management systems. And then you run attack simulations, thousands of attack simulations against fake eight assets on the inside of the network. So virtual machines that have been set up to look just like your regular infrastructure. You don't want to break anything with real attacks. And see if the security controls you have in place actually triggered or if the correlation rules are working. So you might say, you know, give me an alert every time, you know, a person in the finance department logs in from China, uh, but you have to test that to make sure that the correlation rule actually works. And you do that with security instrumentation. So as an example of how not to do breach response, we talk about Buckshot Yankee. This was an incident that occurred with the uh, Department of Defense. They could see uh, agent.ptz, which was just a worm, uh, uh, on their network with their IDS systems. But they couldn't differentiate between an infected and non-infected host. So rather than you know figure out which host was infected and go and clean it up, they just said, you know what, we've got to stop this thing that we can't tamp down, and we are going to re-image 3 million Windows XP machines. Took them nine months to do it. It was all hands on deck, literally. Um, and they managed to eliminate this nasty worm that got loose on their networks. That's not how to do it. The cost for doing that for 3 million Windows XP machines could be as high as a billion dollars. Not pet ya, wanna cry, Stuxnet, SQL Slammer, if we wanna go way back, uh, were autonomous attack tools. Once they were released, uh, against the target, they just went and they just kept going. The future of attack is these types of pre-programmed tools. Um, they're they're going to be AI-like. They infect, they move to their targets, and they steal or damage uh, in minutes, if not seconds. So incident response today is all built around security operations centers, uh, or Lockheed Martin calls theirs a SIC, a Security Intelligence Center. Um, the response times are measured in hours as best in class. So, you know, because the, the average is, you know, 300 days to detect a breach. Um, those companies like Lockheed Martin can do it within hours. They will have to automate. Um, it makes you think of William Gibson's uh, Neuromancer, where the code is self-driven. It's got a target, and it is going to stop at nothing. It will try everything. So that's the future, in my mind, of the targeted defense uh, industry. It's going to be building these types of tools. The first step is get to the point where you can operate and discover breaches in under an hour, if possible, and respond to it. You're going to need security orchestration. And you're going to need to figure the orchestration out because someday you're going to tell your defenses to orchestrate the responses. 
Thank you for your time.